day, everyone. So, uh, okay, so as I as I've mentioned here, uh, this is uh, a talk on passive source localization, and um, I've uh, quite a bit of the work. <laughs> I've, I've talked with Jim Given um, over the years for a lot, and um, uh, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> and then some of the some of the work was done with some other colleagues. Okay. Okay, so what is this problem? The, the version of it that we're thinking about is uh, is like this. We have a, a couple of receivers flying around in the air. We're thinking of them as being moving, and we're thinking of the transmitters as being fixed on the ground. Um, Jim is particularly interested in the problem of finding radar systems, uh, but there are, are lots of other situations where you might want to be finding the location where some electromagnetic energy is being transmitted. And so, uh, yeah, so, so we're, we're specifically thinking about the radar case. Okay, so um, here's a, a simple model for sort of what's going on. We have some source represented by this star that's transmitting some waveform. And uh, this waveform propagates out and then is received at these, these triangles are supposed to be receivers and these arrows are supposed to indicate that they're moving or they could be moving. And so the, the, the signal that's received then is, uh, is a, a time delayed Doppler shifted version of the transmitted signal. So, so you, you get a signal that's, that looks like this, it's scaled by some attenuation and then it's time delayed and it's Doppler shifted and then there's noise added. And, but the problem is we don't know what the original signal was and we don't know where the transmitter is. And so we don't know any of these things down here. We don't know the time delay. We don't know the Doppler shift. We don't know this attenuation. All we measure is this um, overall signal and we don't know how to, how to decompose it in terms of uh, time delays and Doppler shifts. But what you could do is you could look, you, if you use two transmitters, you can look at the difference of the times when they arrive at the two receivers. In fact, I think I'm gonna to go to, I've, I couldn't fit everything on one slide. So let me go to the next slide for a minute and say, you know, suppose you have, uh, you, know, you receive a signal on one uh, receiver with one time delay and you receive a signal on the other receiver with another time delay. What you can do is take the cross correlation of those two signals and you find just from the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality that there's a maximum when the time delay that you put in is the difference of the, the two time delays for the two um, received signals. And so you, you would just plot this cross correlation and where it has a peak, you, that, that value of the time would be the time difference of arrival. And so if you know this time difference of arrival, then if you look at the set of points that, um, the, the, for which the time difference of arrival is a constant, then we know from high school geometry that, that the, the set of points that corresponds to the difference of two distances, difference of distances to two focal points is hyperbola, right? So, so the set of points from the, f that have a constant time difference of arrival, TDOA, is a hyperbola uh, that where the foci are the locations of the two receivers. So in order to do this, you need synchronized clocks, um, but it's clear to see that if you have a bunch of synchronized clocks and a bunch of receivers, from multiple receivers, you could figure out where the so a single source was. If you know ahead of time there's a single source and you have lots of pairs of receivers, you would, for each pair of receivers, you would get these intersecting hyperbolas and where they all intersect, that would be the location of the source. And there are actually commercial systems that are based on this idea that, that do this. So that's one thing you can do, but you need lots of sensors to do that. So another thing you can do is you can look at the, the difference in the frequencies that you receive. So that's known as the frequency difference of arrival. And there's a nice little diagram from uh, Kimberly Hale's dissertation here that, that shows you know, that suppose you have a, um, something transmitting a signal. If you have a receiver that's moving towards it, it'll see a bigger frequency, a higher frequency. And if you have a receiver moving away, it'll see a lower frequency. And if you look at the difference of those, that's the frequency difference of arrival. And uh, it turns out that the, those, the frequency differences correspond to 
the component of the velocity in the direction between the sensor and the, the source. And so this, these hats I'm, I'm denoting by gamma one and gamma two, the locations of the receivers and the X, X here is the location of the source. Uh, the gamma one dot, that's the vector velocity for the source one, for, for the receiver one. Here's the vector velocity for receiver two. And so what you get is the component of the velocity in the direct, in the range direction. And if you look at the difference of those, um, then you can, that gives you some information about where the source is. So in the simple case where one of the sources is fixed, then things simplify a little. So then this term isn't here and you just have this term. So what is the set of points X for which that quantity is constant? Well, the, this is the set of points for which the dot product of from the, uh, the, the, the you know, the constant dot product of the, the vet, between the two vectors, the, the velocity, the sensor velocity and the direction to this source point. So that's a cone, right? And the, the cone intersects a flat plane in hyperbola. And so again, in this case, we get a hyperbola that gives us the set of points where the frequency difference of arrival FDOA is constant. And so um, the idea then is, oh, let's see, let me, so how could you get the FDOA from the data? Uh, I have a page on that. So if you have a, uh, a shifted time shifted a Doppler shifted signal on measured on one receiver, a time shifted Doppler shifted signal measured on the other receiver. What you can do instead of just taking the cross correlation, you can compute the cross ambiguity function, which is uh, the, you have the two signals, one is a shifted version of the other, and then you have this Fourier transform in here. So this is a function of two variables, two parameters that you would put in. And if you again do the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, you'll see that this has a maximum when the time delay tau is this time difference of arrival. And when the frequency nu that you put in here is the frequency difference of arrival. And so you, you would get a picture that looks something like this. You would compute this cross ambiguity function and there would be a peak, you hope there would be a, a big peak. And that the location, the, the uh, time delay parameter gives you the TDOA and the, the frequency parameter gives you the FDOA. So, so you can get the t both TDOA and FDOA from two sensors. And so once you have these, the idea is that you get the, the TDOA from, from the, the, this pair of sensors, and you get the FDOA also from that same pair of sensors, you know, using this cross ambiguity function. And so that tells you that the transmitter has to be at the location where those two intersect. It's it, the real case is a little more complicated than this. So first of all, um, what happens if you have two emitters, two sources? Well, then you have two TDOAs and two FDOAs and they intersect in four points. And you can see that there's gonna be a combinatorial explosion here if you, if you don't know how many, so there gonna be a, there's gonna be an explosion of the numbers of possible locations you'd have to check. So this is a motivation for what uh, Jim Given was mentioning of, of trying to form a SAR-like image. And then the other problem is if you have two, if the velocities of your sensors are both non-zero, then the FDOA curves are a lot more complicated than that nice hyperbola that I drew. And so Jim sent me a, a sequence of, of uh, figures corresponding to different uh, pairs of velocities and vector velocities for the sensors. And you can see um, there, these curves are scary, right? So if you imagine trying to take the intersection of say one of these FDOA curves with the hyperbola that comes from the TDOA, oh, you're likely to have a mess. You have, may have multiple intersection points and uh, it's not so clear what's happening. Okay, so, so here's a little survey of uh, what's done now, of some of the approaches. So, so um, Jim tells me that, that what's in current use is what's referred to as two-step methods. So the idea is here, you would, first you would somehow isolate a single source, uh, the data from a single source. And I'll say a little bit on the next slide how to do that. So if you know ahead of time that you have a single source in your scene, then you, uh, from the data, 
you have a problem of um, first you can try to use you know the cross correlation cross correlation cross ambiguity function or or statistical coherence um, to get these intermediate quantities the TDOAs FDOAs and the AOAs are angles of arrival so if you have um, arrays sensor arrays on each one of your platforms that are moving or something that gives you direction then you can do some beam forming and that get angles of arrival and that gives you the, uh, the ability to do something like triangulation okay but the so the the idea with this two-step method is you go from the data you do this intermediate problem to get these quantities tdoas and fdoas maybe angles of arrival and then you have a problem of figuring out given all this information where is the source and so you can solve systems of polynomial equations. You, know, you can use um, code like Bertini or Macaulay 2, or you can use iterative solvers. You'd have to do some kind of solving a system of equations to figure out the source position. Then there's another class of approaches is to try to use all the data together. Um, so one thing you could try to do is to use a, this is the synthetic aperture type of approach. You would try to back project your cross correlation or cross ambiguity function or something like that. And then you would sum those views coherently and try to form an image. So, so this is kind of an imaging approach and this is kind of more of a, you might call this detection estimation approach. Um, the, of course, uh, dividing, splitting this into these two categories is a little bit artificial, but, but, um, but th that's kind of a, a general view of, of uh, the techniques that are, that are known. And I wanted to mention that the, when you do this imaging kind of approach, where you get a focus is determined bo by both the TDOA and FDOA. So this gives you a justification for, you know, we really need to kind of learn something about what these FDOA curves are doing because they they come up in, no matter what you try to do. Can, can yeah. I ask, what's the relationship to, um, for all these things to maximum likelihood? Like, for instance, I, I might just want, uh, you know, given the, given the locations, what's the likelihood of the data? And then mm -hmm. I might want to maximize that likelihood. Um, that's, right would be the most naive thing. What's the relationship between these methods and that? Yeah, so, so you, you know, those maybe could fit in either approach. You could, you could think of those as one of these uh, two-step methods, or if you are going to solve your maximum likelihood problem by something that involves sort of imaging, maybe you would, um, you, maybe you would think of that as, as, uh, as one of these one-step methods. Yeah, so I, I don't know if that that really answers your, your question, but but that's certainly a, a reasonable thing to do is to use a maximum likelihood kind of estimation. I just wanted to say um, just briefly that um, that's an extremely interesting question. Um, we need to bear in mind the fact that um, all of these measurements that are in this rectangular box here, uh, we have all these AOAs and TDOAs and FDOAs, but they're not independent. They're not independent measurements because, of course, we really only have three degrees of freedom if the source is in in three space, and uh, uh, only two degrees of freedom if it's on a known surface. And so, um, setting up and solving that problem is highly non-trivial, but um, um, that'll start to come more into view as Margaret uh, continues. I just wanted to sort of re reserve a, a place there. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we can certainly discuss more of this later too. So, so um, at the moment, I wanted to say something about, so how could you go about trying to isolate a single source? So, um, so this is an example, this is a cartoon of what a time frequency plot at a single receiver might look like. So here I have in mind a short time Fourier transform. So you see all this stuff going on, right, in your time frequency plot, you see um, you know, that's probably, a, that looks like a chirp. That's probably linear, linear frequency modulated waveform. That's probably a radar. You know, maybe that's a radar too. This, this may be a communication signal, but you know, it, it sort of looks as if the coding is different here. And, and, uh, and what, what are these things? You know, is that the same signal that's in two different places or is that two different signals in here? It looks like things are overlapping what's going on there. So, so it's, it would be really nice if we could um, use uh, knowledge about where the emitter is located to help separate out these signals, 
But at the same time, some of the, the methods for figuring out where the signal is located assumes there's only one. So, so what you could do is you could say, like, okay, we think this is a radar. So we'll just cut, cut out the data that corresponds to this, um, to this, uh, whoops, let's see here. Yeah, I lost my cursor. Yeah, we'll, we'll just cut out the data that corresponds to this part of the time frequency domain. And we'll use that just in this part here to estimate its TDOA and FDOA. And then we'll do, uh, and then we'll estimate the, the source location for that because we're pretty sure that's probably just a single source. You know, for something like this, it's a little less clear what's going on. And then if you have different receivers, at the time frequency plot at the different receivers would be a little different. They would probably be similar to this, but the, the, the various features would be shifted around you know, the, the, there would be Doppler shifts, there might be different time delays. And so the one way of looking at this problem is how do you use the, the time frequency plots from the, from the different receivers to figure out where the emitters are? But then shouldn't we be also using information that corresponds to cross correlation? So anyway, so, so this is one way of sort of approaching this problem is from this time frequency plot. And um, I, I could maybe say that Jim, Jim's approach is, you know, he comments that the first thing you would do is you always would form a time frequency plot like this. And so why don't we just do all the processing in the time frequency domain? And that seems to be a, a legitimate um, point of view. <laughs> so, okay, now I come from the inverse problems community. So I'm always trying to turn things into a, an inverse problem for a partial differential equation. And so, so here's, here's sort of an attempt to do that. Um, so you, you would have a wave equation. So, so here I'm actually ignoring also po the polarization of the wave. That's a potential, something that maybe we should consider. But, but if you just model the electromagnetic field by a scalar, then you would have the scalar wave equation. And the source would be represented, well, you could think of, of a source term as the waveform emitted from, say, location, from location X. Okay, and then, then the data that you would measure, okay, so you have uh, sensors flying along flight paths. And so you would have this electric field, but measured along those flight paths. So you'd have the, the field at uh, time T at position gamma one of T and the, the, the field at the other sensor. And so the idea would be from this kind of data, you would wanna figure out what this, um, what this source is. And of course, there's always noise too. So, so I, I, this is sort of what I just said. From the data, you want to figure out what the what the source is. But the problem here is that um, it's dramatically underdetermined. So here we're trying to find a, a source that depends on well time because we want to know what the what the source is doing. You know, is it a radar? Is it a communication signal? And then we also know want to know where it is. So. This is a function of three variables if you try to do an imaging kind of reconstruction. So you have uh, two variables there, uh, sorry, one variable time and two variables of position. That's assuming you know, you're, we're assuming that the source is on a, a plane on a, a known surface. So we have th a, we're trying to find a function of three variables, but the data we have well, it looks like two functions of one variable. What, you know, maybe there are really two variables. Maybe it's really two functions of two variables because there's a separation of the time scales. These uh, sensors move on a much slower time scale than the electromagnetic waves propagate. So maybe there are two functions of two variables, but that's still underdetermined. So maybe we should give up on trying to find this whole this right-hand side, this source term, and instead, maybe what we would, maybe we would be happy by happy um, with knowing the energy that's transmitted at each location. So that would be a function of two variables. So that maybe you'd want to find that, but oh, now it's nonlinear. <laughs> so um, and and certainly we should incorporate sparsity in this problem because usually you don't have uh, you know an entire field full of you know, with um, sources transmitting at every single point. So, so uh, there, there should be some kind of sparsity in this problem. Anyway, but this, this, the, the, it, we can't just turn this into a standard inverse problem because of this underdetermined nature. Okay, so today what I'm gonna do is just talk about two small pieces of this big problem, 
Okay, so so one is uh, what do we do about these FDOA surfaces? You know, there's a there's some interesting geometry that's going on here, and then um, and then I'm probably going to run out of time, but uh, I'll I'll try to say a little bit about these synthetic aperture approaches where we sort of a one step method where we try to combine this um, approach with the synthetic aperture kind of approach. Okay, so this is just a slide really to establish notation. Uh, let's assume that we measure the, the frequencies of the um, trans of the of the, the the frequencies of the waveforms we um, on the on the receivers in such a way and combine them in such a way that we don't have to worry about what the carrier frequency of the of the transmitted signal was. So so for example, you could take the the two frequencies you measure on the receivers and divide them and then the, the carrier frequency cancels out. So in this case, the FDOA is given by these, here's the, this, um, here, here's the geometry. The sensor is at position gamma one or gamma two and the, the unit vector from that sensor to the source is, uh, I should have mentioned I'm using hats for unit vectors. So, um, so that's a unit vector, and then that's dotted with the velocity. And so that's uh, the downrange component of one velocity and the downrange component of the other velocity. And those unit vectors may be different. Okay, okay so, so here's the FDOA again, just to remind you. So one of the first things we can do is, you know, suppose we differentiate with respect to the source position. It, this is you know, this will give you some information about the sensitivity of the FDOA to the source location. And when you differentiate these unit vectors, you, you, get, the, you get these projection operators, the scaled projection operators. You know, this is, a, um, this is a, a, a calculation that will take about three lines and I'm not gonna go through it here. You know, if you've done it many times, then you, this will be familiar. If not, you can just sort of take my word for it. You get a, an operator in the numerator that, that projects a vector onto the plane perpendicular to this range vector, okay? So this is just removing the component of the velocity in the direction of this range. And then there's a scale uh, due to the, the distance also. And so, we, so one thing you notice here is that um, when you take this derivative, you have these distances in the denominator and when you go far, when your source is far away from your receivers, these distances are gonna be big and these numerators are gonna be, you know, well, there would be the, the order of the velocities, sensor velocities. So when you go far away, the, the change in the FDOA is small. That means that it, the inverse problem is gonna be unstable, that small changes in the FDOA could correspond to large changes in your source position. Okay, but if we still think about what happens far away, then it turns out that um, if you, uh, it, it, I guess the way to think about this is if you look far away from, if you look at the, if your source is a, a large distance away relative to how far apart your receivers are, then the direction to the source looks about the same from the two different receivers, right? And so, so you really just have, these two directions look about the same. And so if you, uh, if you just make them the same, you find that in the far field, the, the FDOA is just uh, the difference of velocities dotted with a unit vector to the source. And that set is cone. So that's reasonably simple in the far field. And then if the velocities are the same, then again, you can look back up here, the, the velocities are the same, then you just have the difference of these unit vectors and so you could approximate the distance, the, the difference of the unit vectors by its by the derivative of the unit vector. Here are derivatives of the unit vectors, these projection operators. So you end up with, when the velocities are the same, you end up with this uh, projection operator where you have the, the velocity dotted with this, the projection of the difference, the vector difference between the sensors um, on the, again, projected onto the plane perpendicular to the range. Anyway. So, um, so in, in this case where you have equal velocities, you can kind of make a, a polar coordinate plot easily by just interchanging this denominator with FDOA. So for a given value of FDOA, you could just, this tells you, this gives you a formula that tells you what the, 
what the, the distance, what the distance of the curve is from the origin uh, in the direction that you choose. Okay, so so I've got some plots here. Yeah, so so these are versions of those FDOA plots that are similar to the ones that Jim Given sent you know, that I showed before, but these are zoomed out so you can see what ha what's happening farther away from the sensors. And you can see that we have this complicated behavior near the sensors in the near field, but far away, all these constant FDOA curves become lines. So that's as predicted by the theory. So every, everything becomes linear in the far field. So that's, uh, that's encouraging. And then if, you, if your velocities are the same, then you can make these polar plots. So these are the actual plots of the constant FDOA curves, the ISO FDOA curves or level sets. Uh, and then here's the, these are plots from that approximation I showed. And, you know, they show roughly the same characteristics. So of course, what we want to do is we want to use the time difference variable and frequency difference variable to together to figure out where the source is. So if you have the, in an unequal velocity case, okay, so we have the, the, um, the TDOA in the far field. So those curves are hyperbolas, which become lines. They're asymptotically linear in the far field. And then we have these FDOA curves that also asymptotically become lines. They're, these lines all go through the origin. And so the problem is, that they're the same line for the TDOA and the FDOA because it's the lot that line contains the origin where near where the sensors are and the source. So it's got to be the same line. So, so unfortunately, using TDOA and FDOA in this geometry, in the two-dimensional geometry, doesn't work very well in the far field. So it's not as nice as those nice intersecting hyperbolas that I showed on the like slide number three or something like that. If you have equal velocities of your sensors, then you have a, a better situation. You have these sort of figure eight kind of things. And then they, those do give intersections with the, with the hyperbola, the, the asymptotic version of the hyperbola, unless you happen to, unless your source happens to lie along one of these degenerate lines, which, so these, you have these degeneracies where the, the FDOA is zero, um, if your source lies along the velocity axis or along the sensor axis. So even in this case where you have equal velocities, you get some bad behavior. What about the 3D case? So, so, uh, he, so here, these are a bunch of plots um, with the sensors always at the same location. And these are color coded. So the, the red uh, surfaces correspond to near field uh, near field surface and the cyan corresponds to a far field surface in the sense that I required these uh, surfaces to pass through the point either 111 for the near field or 1100 for the far field. So that's how they were produced. And you see in the near field, you get this strange, scary behavior with these little blobs of stuff. Um, and you, the, the, you have these sort of horns that occur that, so there are always singularities at the sensor position. So you get this weird behavior, but in the far field, when you go far away, things are looking much better. So we get something that looks sort of like a cone and far away, even if it's doing weird things um, near the sensors. And then here are some more velocities. You notice these, these horns sort of turn up pretty often. <laughs> and then they, we also have nice, uh, nicer behavior in the far field. And then um, if you have equal velocities, then in uh, we often get this, um, you know, it's not quite a torus because there's something weird going on at the origin, but, uh, but at least these are sort of closed curves where, so you might hope that these will intersect the uh, TDOA hyperbola, hyperboloids in a reasonable way. Pardon me, I, I really wondered, uh, um, is that genus zero or genus one? I mean, is there, is there an honest to God hole in the center of that the donut here? Uh, well, the, we behaviors, the behavior is complicated there. You know, that, that, so it's, it's a little confusing because there are also these, there are always the singularities at the source locations. So 
um, I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't make any claims at this point about what's what exactly is going on at the origin. But yeah, that's that 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 would be something to to look into. Okay. Uh, so here's a here's a sequence of um, surfaces as the FDOA increases. So the FDOA has to be in a finite interval, and as you go as you go through that interval, here's what the 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 curves that the the surfaces look like for a particular pair of velocities. So again, notice you have this horn situation, and then um, and then as you uh, as the the FDOA decreases. This, I don't know if you can tell the scale here is getting much smaller. This just shrinks, this shrinks off to, out to nothing. So now I, I was uh, complaining to Jim that it's, it looks like this TDOA, FDOA um, source localization method didn't really work. And he said, well, sure it works. <laughs> you know, we do this all the time. And so I started, I thought more carefully about what what's happening in the geometry that the Navy's probably interested in. And well, that would be a geometry where your sensors are flying around above, you know, the earth, right? And so if we look at what's happening asymptotically in the case of unequal velocities that the FDOA is a cone, right? And the TDOA also gives you a cone, but it's a different cone. Well, those cones can intersect a flat plane in hyperbolas and those hyperbolas can have a nice transverse intersection. So even though the 3D cones may be intersecting along a, the same line, then you, when you include the fact that they're intersected with a horizontal plane in this kind of geometry, then, then that's a reasonable, uh, then, then we do get a, a nice TDOA, FDOA kind of uh, transverse intersection. Okay, so, so this is sort of a conclusion for at least what we understand about the geometry so far. The far fields reasonably understood it when the, in the unequal velocity case, we get cones. When the velocities are equal, we get these, I don't know, they're not tori, but uh, they're, they're, they're kind of reasonable shapes. Um, and uh, for using both TDOA and FDOA to do localization, um, it's okay if the velocities are equal, and otherwise, uh, it's okay for this uh, sort of quasi near field region. And really, we don't know what's going on in the near field. So, so there's some interesting uh, algebraic geometry to study here. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so now I'm. The plan is to move on to the second uh, topic of the second approach of uh, trying to sort of combine these ideas with a synthetic aperture image formation. Um, so if, if there are any questions about the geometry stuff, then uh, <laughs> well, maybe we should leave all the questions to later anyway. Okay, so this is sort of part two. So here the idea again is we're gonna have receivers and for all, this entire uh, part, I'm gonna assume that one of them is fixed. And the reason for that is because we know if we've got velocities, non-zero velocities, then we have this horrible uh, near field behavior, right? And so let's just look at the case where one of them is fixed. <laughs> so, so I drew a little, I uh, to, used a clip art of a little drone there, okay. Okay, so, so this is going back to sort of the inverse problems approach where we want to think of things in terms of the partial differential equations. So, uh, so here we've got the wave equation uh, for the electric field, uh, one component of the electric field. And then here we are making a, a sparsity kind of assumption about what the sources look like. So we're, we're saying, let's say this is a sum of a finite number of sources at locations E sub n, and those, they're transmitting waveforms P sub n. So then you can use, uh, you can write down the solution of, the, of this wave equation for that kind of uh, source. And you get just a time delayed. Um, uh, and here, here I should point out that I'm also using this separation of the time scales into slow time and fast time. And I'm not trying to measure Doppler shifts in the, uh, in the fast time variable. So the, the Doppler shifts here would be accommodated by looking at the changes 
as the sensor moves along. Okay, so, so you just get a time delay of time delayed waveform, and then there's a geometrical spreading factor. And so what we're gonna do is take cross correlations of, of these signals. So of course, once you start doing cross correlations, then everything's nonlinear, right? So you know, we start out with an original problem that's linear, and immediately we're turning into something nonlinear, but well, um, we don't know what else to do, okay. So when you um, multiply these things together, you have a product of two sums, and that product of sums will involve some terms that are multiplied together that correspond to the same source. And those, those are the diagonal terms, we'll say. And then there are some terms here that correspond to multiplying one, one uh, source over here times a different source over here, and we'll, we'll refer to those as cross terms. Okay, so, so we don't really like the cross terms because they're, they're corresponding to different sources interacting with each other and we are sort of hoping they don't interact with each other. So, so the, the idea is we're gonna try to use just those diagonal terms to form an image. Well, we still, don't, we still can't really do this unless we make this other bad assumption that we really don't like, but, um, but we don't know what to, else to do. If we make this assumption, then we can get, make some progress. And that is um, effectively we're saying that these, these um, we're, we're taking the, the autocorrelation, I've written it in the Fourier domain now, and then we're taking that energy from all the autocorrelations of all the, um, from all the different sources, and we're sort of spreading the energy around among all the sources so that we can write the, um, the effect of the source as a product of a function of space times a function of frequency. Okay, that's not really a very good assumption, but if we do this, if we make this assumption, then we can kind of make some progress. So, so one, of the, one of the issues with this approach is we don't like this, <laughs> but okay, but, but let's go ahead and see what we can do when we make this assumption. Okay, so then when we plug things in, plug in this approximation into the cross correlation, maybe I should go back here. Remember what we're doing, we're taking cross correlation from for these uh, for the, the signals from the different sensors. It turns out that when we make this approximation, then we can write this, um, this the diagonal terms with the same source from both products, both factors. We can write that as in terms of a, a, the time difference of arrival from, for us a, a single source. For each, for each source, we have a, an expression here that involves the time difference of arrival from that source measured on the two different receivers. And then we have a bunch of other stuff. And the, the, the reason this is nice is that now we have, now we're back to a linear problem again, where we're looking for this source density function. And now this, now we have a linear operator operating on this. Here's the the um, waveform autocorrelation that's kind of been spread around, around among all these different sources. And then this is just geometrical spreading factors and so forth. So here, this is a nice operator. This has the nice form as a, it's a Fourier integral operator. So the Fourier integral operator is a particular type of integral operator where you have a, an integral over a, it's usually called a frequency variable, which in this case does have the frequency interpretation. And then the phase has to satisfy some certain conditions that I'm not going to go through, and the, the amplitude has to satisfy conditions that correspond to it's not being part of the amplitude, part of, part of the phase, and so forth. So anyway, but it has the, the form of a Fourier integral operator, and once we have the, the expression in this form, then we can form an image based on back projecting. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, there's a, a formal theory for forming approximate inverses of Fourier integral operators. And you can just sort of plug and chug, crank, <laughs> crank this through. You uh, effectively, uh, the, the idea is you sort of smear out the data over all the, all the uh, locations where it could have come from. So in other words, we're sort of back projecting on these hyperbolas and then you add for, you add those contributions from all the different uh, source locations, for, from all the different receiver locations, for all the data you have. So it's, it's sort of a form of filtered back projection 
if you're familiar with the radon transform, it's like doing the radon transform, except instead of over lines, over hyperboles. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of, I only have like five minutes here, so I'm uh, kind of rushing through the second part. Okay, so the question is, we've formed this image based on only on the diagonal terms, what happens to the cross terms? Well, it turns out that if the waveforms are different enough, <laughs> I'll call it uncorrelated, whatever that means, then it turns out that these cross terms vanish in the image. If you, if you add more and more views, then it turns out that, that the cross terms just go away. And so um, that's, that's wonderful. We don't, we don't really have analysis to explain you know, <laughs> how different the waveforms have to be, but we've observed this numerically that it works well. But what if, um, what if all the sources are transmitting the same waveform? That's like the worst possible situation. It turns out that these cross terms still only focus at the correct position. So here's a, here's a numerical uh, example. So if you, if you have a very, uh, you know, I think this is maybe from a single view or very narrow aperture, you have all this stuff that looks like lots of sources, but as you, fly along and add contributions from more different locations, you find that the, the contributions from, uh, from the cross terms are spreading out, they're smearing out, whereas the, the contributions from the, the correct locations are focusing up. So the, the correct uh, locations are these, these dots that are nice and focused. Now this has to be maybe, um, I don't know, something like 30 degrees of aperture, kind of a big aperture, so it's not great. Um, and the idea why this is happening is if you have a cross term, if you, if you have a term that corresponds to two different sources in different locations, when you add together all these hyperbolas for the different TUAs, they don't focus up, they kind of smear out. You have an envelope of, uh, of, uh, of, of all these curves. Whereas if you have just a single, source, then they all go through, they focus up, they all go through the same location. Uh, so if you use this synthetic aperture kind of imaging scheme to do the, to locate the sources, and you make this bad approximation that we don't like about smearing the energy around, then it turns out that you can analyze exactly what you get uh, by this image formation process in the sense that you can plug in the expression for the data, interchange the order into the imaging operator, interchange the order of integration, and do a, a stationary phase calculation to figure out where the main contributions to your image are coming from. And the stationary phase calculation shows you that the, the image is formed is based on making the TDOAs match and also making the FDOAs match. So the, the stationary phase calculation tells you that both TDOAs and FDOAs are important, even though we only did cross correlations here. We didn't do a cross ambiguity function when we started. Okay, and then we can also get resolution. Um, and what you do is you look at this, uh, this point spread function that you get and you can change variables. And um, in this um, approach, you can figure out which components, which Fourier components of your target region are you getting? And so you can analyze the resolution. This also tells you, uh, this, this, this gives you some information about what contributions from different source locations are giving you in terms of the image Fourier components. Okay, I think I don't really have time to talk much about that. So I'll just go to a summary here. So, so uh, in, in this approach, we've combined cross correlation with synthetic aperture imaging. Um, and we end up with these cross terms. And this is because now some people, when they look at, some researchers have made what they what might call an incoherent source approximation. If they, if they assume that the sources are all random and that they're um, delta correlated, then these cross term problems go away. But, but we're looking for radar systems. So we're looking for chirps and things like that. So, so we're not assuming that the sources are delta correlated. We're assuming the, that they're deterministic and therefore we have these cross-term problems. Uh, so the, 
we've been able to do some analysis of the cross terms and show that they focus only at the correct locations. We can analyze resolution. Uh, and the, there's a paper here that, that you can uh, look at for, uh, for more information. And sorry, this has been, this is kind of very uh, quick here, uh, very cursory uh, summary. So there are lots of open questions. One is, um, you know, we don't like this assumption we had to make about the waveforms. We don't really understand how different waveforms have to be in order for their cross terms to go away. Um, you know, we started with a cross correlation function here. Jim has been arguing, really, we should be starting with a cross ambiguity function. Well, which is right? We don't know. <laughs> so there are arguments on both sides. Uh, what happens to the artifacts? How, long, how far do you have to integrate to get the artifacts to go away? Um, and then this was only for the case of of one receiver stationary and the other one moving, what if both receivers are moving? Then you have to deal with these FDOA, these wild FDOA uh, surfaces, right? Um, we haven't thought about, about what are desirable and undesirable flight paths. We don't know what happens if you don't know exactly where your sensors are. And uh, this approach uh, did not handle noise. Now, um, with uh, uh, we have a separate project where we're looking at the at noise and a st uh, more statistical approach. Could you clarify moving? What you mean by moving is that if you had two aircraft, or are you saying that it would be so sensitive even towards a ground vehicle, uh, relatively slow movement? Well, so so here we've made the assumption that the, all the sources are st stationary, right? So so we're ruling out the ground moving ground vehicle right away. Okay, that's that's a harder problem because you have not only the unknowns of the position, but you also have the unknown velocity of your target, right? So, so we're doing the simple case where we're assuming that all the sources are stationary and it's only the receivers are moving and we supposedly know their velocities and their paths, right? So, so but, but in this analysis, the synthetic aperture analysis, we still used one of the receivers stationary and one moving. And that's to avoid this complication with the FDOA curves. Right? So uh, did that answer the question? I'll, I'll have to think about it. Thank you. OK, yeah, I'm happy to chat more. Okay. And then, um, then there, there are lots of other issues here. Uh, I've only written a, a small number down here that, um, you know, we, we really don't know what's going on with these FDOA curves, <laughs> where you have two, both, both sensors moving. Um, and then. Um, we'd like to be able to exploit some partial information about the waveform. Suppose we know ahead of time that the waveform is a chirp, but we don't know what kind of chirp it is, how, what the chirp rate is. Um, when can we treat other waveforms as noise? We don't know. There, there, there are lots of other questions. Jim can probably fill in lots of other, other questions, but I think I should. Oh, and then I also want to point out, I was just talking about the free space case. We would like to be able to do the same source localization problem for sonar. And here's a plot from Comsol about that shows the, the ray paths. This is the, the paths along which acoustic energy propagates and it's tremendously complicated. So, so there's, there's a lot, there are a lot of problems here, uh, but I should stop. Okay, so thank you.